Hi, name's Dash. Once upon a time, I made a game that looks like this. Now I'm working on a game that looks like this. Let's talk about that, shall we? For those of you who haven't seen my other videos, the name of my game is Serenity, and it's a rhythm game RPG that I've been working on for a little while. Conceptually, it's very similar to my previous game, Disharmony, but pretty much everything has better execution. Something you'll know if you have eyeballs and have also seen my previous game is that it doesn't look very good. As I've explained in the past, the style I went with was basically finalized when I was 17 or so and barely had any experience making any pixel art. My approach this time around involved going back to that original style and rethinking it from the ground up and trying to add as much appeal as possible. It's also quite a bit more detailed than the previous game, but it still uses a lot of those bold flat colors. The characters have defined eyes instead of wonky dark voids. They have more detailed shading, and their animations feel much more grounded. All the animations are drawn frame by frame, and I'm trying to approach their creation in the same way I would if it were traditional 2D animation. While the game runs at 60fps, the animations are mainly drawn at multiples of 6 to mirror how traditional animation is typically drawn at 12 to 24 frames per second. Unlike my previous project, Serenity's characters have sprites for facing 8 directions and not just 4. While this greatly increases the workload for me, it does just look that much better. I've always felt annoyed at how smooth the movement looks in Mother 2 and 3 compared to Disharmony, and this was a good opportunity to rectify that. Some areas now have elements that make use of a parallax effect. A few parts in Disharmony used some kind of parallax, that was pretty much only the case with parts where the camera only moved horizontally and not vertically. This was achieved by adding each layer of the room to a data structure map and multiplying the speed at which each layer moves relative to the camera based on how close they are to it. But hey, you're not looking at this and wondering how I achieved the parallax effects, you're probably thinking about the most icon catching parts, the lighting. Lighting is one of the best ways to make a game look interesting. That doesn't just go for all the big budget AAA games either. I remember playing Eastwood a couple years ago and being very impressed by its lighting. Towards the end of 2022, maybe the beginning of 2023, I watched this video explaining certain aspects of Breath of the Wild's lighting engine. The video in question is made by a guy named Jasper, who has made plenty of videos that I found interesting in the past. I like this video so much that it got me interested in the idea of making a lighting engine on my own, but I didn't know where to get started. After some research, I found that a user named Strawberry Jam had made a demo for a deferred lighting engine and uploaded it to the GameMaker forums, which I found to be particularly interesting. The source code was available for free, so I had a look at it and... oh boy. While the work put in by Strawberry Jam was, and still is, absolutely incredible, the code straight up didn't work when I tried to run it. After tinkering with it for a while, I did get it to work. However, after actually trying to apply some of its features into a proper game, I quickly realized it just wasn't a good fit. If a sprite was drawn with any level of displacement from its object's coordinates, the lighting simply wouldn't follow. In fact, if you used any non-default drawing functions, it would completely mess up the lighting. There were a lot of features I didn't need that were just cluttering up the code, and a lot of features I did want that simply weren't implemented. So I did what any reasonable person would do and simply spent months of my life reverse engineering it from the ground up. It took quite a while to get everything working, but I was really happy with it by the end. The engine makes use of normal maps and specular maps to draw its lighting. If you're interested in knowing what exactly those are, I recommend watching the aforementioned video by Jasper on the subject and how it applies to Breath of the Wild. But here's a quick rundown for those of you who don't have 35 minutes. Normal maps are images that show the normals, basically the facing directions, of any given pixel. The game uses the red, green, and blue channels of any pixel on the normal map to determine how far left and right, up and down, and forward and back it is facing. After comparing the pixel's facing angle to the position of a light source, it knows how much light to bring to that pixel. Basically, if a pixel is facing left and there is a light to the left of it, it will be lit up by a lot, whereas the other pixels that face away from left will get considerably less light. This is done automatically in 3D since the game has to calculate where each polygon is facing by necessity, but I have to do them by hand. This is of course especially fun for me, who has a partial colorblindness. <laughs> Specular maps are a lot easier to explain. The brighter a pixel is, the shinier it is. If something is made of glass or metal, its specular map should be very bright. Much like with normal maps, these have to be drawn by hand. The game also makes use of cell shading to create this very poppy, cartoony sort of look, which is basically accomplished by using a lerp function that only gives the pixel light if it goes above a certain threshold. If only there were a video explaining how cell shading works in an easy to understand way and oh would you look at that, Jasper made one about Wind Waker and how its lighting works. Isn't that a crazy coincidence? 
although unlike Wind Waker's shading, Serenity actually uses both smooth and cell shading at the same time, meaning you get both color gradients and sharp bands of color. That's actually what Wind Waker HD does as well, which wasn't intentional, but I do like that look. Lights can be given any color, and the ambient light of the scene can as well. We can tint the world a dark red, as if a blood moon was beaming down on the earth below. A bright orange for a sunny day, a cool blue for a nighttime scene, or a moody greenish blue for a rainy afternoon. Now, the application of this engine is obviously not supposed to look realistic. If I wanted to make a realistic looking game, I wouldn't be using pixel art in Game Maker. I don't really care too much if all the lighting doesn't always make sense, as long as it looks visually appealing and adds to the mood. If we keep going at it with the Zelda comparisons, think of the inside of the clock tower in Majora's Mask, where everything is inexplicably lit from below, or the many objects in Wind Waker which, even when standing directly in the shade, always retain their highlights projected onto them by the sun. The point here isn't to make something that mirrors real life, it's to give the game a cool aesthetic. That doesn't just go for the lighting, but for the overall art style as well. To paraphrase Nintendo's GDC talk about Breath of the Wild from a few years ago, a good video game art style is not just one that resembles reality, but one that makes it easy to lie. If the player can look at the game and accept what's happening, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work exactly the way it would in reality. One issue I had with the lighting engine, even after reworking it myself, was that the engine struggled to keep up with the game at a sub-pixel level. This meant that if a sprite's position or rotation were to be displaced by an amount less than one pixel at a time, the lighting would lag behind. My solution was actually to do something I was planning to do anyways, which takes us to my next point. The resolution of the game is 640 by 360 pixels, same as Disharmony and a ton of other indie games. It's got a 16 by 9 aspect ratio that scales well to most common monitors, and it sits at a pretty comfortable level to work with artistically, in terms of screen space and detail. However, what a lot of you might not know is that modern pixel art games tend to mix the resolution and pixel scaling quite a bit. You can have a 32 by 32 character rotate a full 360 degrees, and they'll maintain their sharp angles. Help, even Disharmony did this a few times. And while this can look great for some games, I kind of hate the way it looks most of the time. Sean Spalding has made the comparison to a real-world camera a few times. If you imagine your game as a world being viewed through a low-resolution camera, you expect those pixels to be the same size, otherwise the illusion is broken. While this might be a controversial opinion, I would take a game in the style of Sea of Stars or Final Fantasy's recent pixel remasters any day over Square Enix's HD 2D style, as I find myself annoyed at the oftentimes high-resolution backgrounds consisting of high-poly models juxtaposed against 16-bit sprites. What is this? You don't belong! Here? No, you do not live in this world. I refuse to believe it. <clears throat> so I basically clamp my game's resolution to 640x360 to make sure it always remains consistent. And while it is a side effect, this actually nullifies the issue of the lighting not keeping up with the subpixels. After all, there's no subpixels left to render. Happy accidents! If you hadn't guessed by how much I've talked about it, this took a lot of time and effort to put together. I basically had to learn to use GLSL for this project alone, and while I still have a lot to learn, I feel like I've come a long way. There's still plenty more to mention about the game on a stylistic level, like the dust that floats around in the air, the Wind Waker-esque smoke and fire particles, the little dust trail you create when you run or land on the ground. But I'm sure I'll make more videos about the game's aesthetic in the future, so I'll save that for another time. Though, let's not kid ourselves. The biggest difference between my old game and my new one is that I went from creating a cast of characters composed almost entirely of people with red hair to a cast composed almost entirely of people with blue hair. And yeah, I think that's about it for now. If you enjoy the video and you want to see more in the future, you know what to do. Thanks a ton for watching the video all the way to the end, it means a lot. And as I always say at the end of my videos, have a good day.